Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including AB Puppy, Dale Mulcahy, Matt Zaglin, and new patron, Colon3, a.k.a. Flirty Little Catface. On this episode Hi, of DTNS, did OpenAI just kill Google? Is X too weird to train an LLM? And Will Harris talks about the challenges of bug squashing. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 26th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Shank. And joining us, CEO of Unbound.com, reader-powered publishing, Will Harris, the original Brito. Welcome Yay. back. Good Welcome afternoon, back, gang. It is so lovely to be here. I mean, it's evening for me, afternoon for you guys. It's a, it's a pleasure as always. Uh, we're ripping you away from the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. I apologize. Ah, uh, that's all right. Um, that wasn't that wasn't on my uh, all, that wasn't on my schedule for this evening. All I'm doing is listening to back to back podcasts about Deadpool Wolverine. So that's my <laughs> evening's entertainment. All right, we'll try to work that in so that this can be one of those podcasts. Uh, let's start with the quick hits. Video game voice actors and performance capture artists went on strike in the U.S. Friday morning over a dispute on how motion capture performances will be compensated. The studios treat some physical performances as data that the sag after union thinks should be counted as performances. For example, somebody who did stunt work would be paid for their performance, but a studio might be able to train a model on that same performance with no further compensation. The strike is only against large video game studios as independent and lower budget projects are covered under a separate agreement that was reached back in February. Yeah, so a big video game, say having Deadpool and Wolverine in it, would not be covered by that agreement. Smooth, smooth. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Deadpool was disappointed to find out that a company called Binarly has found two related compromises to Secure Boot. Secure Boot's part of your system that protects it from malware installed during boot up. Uh, if you get malware to install during boot up, that avoids it being detected by your operating system. It's a bad thing. One compromise came because the platform key, which secures Secure Boot, was posted on GitHub in an encrypted file protected by a four character passcode, something trivial to crack. The other was because several manufacturers used test code from a company called AMI in their shipping product, despite the platform key in the test code containing the string do not trust or do not ship. So all told, because companies didn't change these platform keys, more than 500 devices from almost all device makers are affected. They are not consumer devices, and in a lot of cases, they're discontinued devices. Uh, but if a manufacturer does not offer a firmware update for it, perhaps because it's discontinued, companies are advised to replace the affected device. It's standard practice these days for pretty much everything to leak ahead of a Google announcement, not just little details, but pictures and specs, the whole caboodle. So not a big surprise that ahead of Google's Pixel event, which is scheduled for August 13th, 91 Mobiles got sent Pixel 9 marketing pages by tipster Steve Hemmerstoffer, aka OnLeaks. Among the many revelations, it says that Pixel 9 Pro, Pixel Pro XL, 9 Pro XL, and 9 Pro Fold will all come with Gemini Advanced for free for one year. Not to be left out, Samsung's upcoming One UI 7 update was leaked by a uh, X user named Chun VN8888. After India reduced its import taxes on smartphones, Apple announced a price cut of 3 to 4% on its smartphones in India. Uh, the phones are still more expensive than elsewhere, though. The cheapest iPhone 15 Pro model costs the equivalent of $1,550 if you buy it in India in rupees, while its list price in the U.S. is $999. Apple's phone shipments did rise 39% in India last year, making it the fifth largest market for Apple's phones. Epic Games announced it will bring Fortnite and Rocket Lead Sideswipe to the EU alternative app store for iOS called Alt Store Pal, P-A-L. That's in addition to Epic Games' own alternative app store. Alt Store Pal was one of the first alternative iOS app stores launched when Apple started allowing it in the EU back in April as a result of regulatory requirements. Epic says it will bring Fortnite to other alt stores as well. It'll stop offering Fortnite and other apps in Samsung's Galaxy Store after Samsung changed its policy to block sideloading on its devices. 
<laughs> All right, let's get to the big news that rudely broke during DTNS showtime. Uh, so rude of OpenAI to do that. Uh, next time before DTNS starts, It's like they starts, don't please. even respect our craft. Yeah, seriously. You know, uh, come on. If you're a patron, you did hear uh, Justin and Sarah and Rob talk about it in Good Day Internet, but OpenAI announced Search GPT, which you can find at chatgpt.com slash search. It is an invite-only product, uh, about 10,000 test users getting it right now. If you don't have access, you can join a wait list, and then you can get invited in later when they decide to add more testers. If you do get access, what you see is pretty simple. It's a search box with the phrase, what are you looking for? The results are also very clean. Results are oriented around short summaries to give context with links to where the info came from. So the example they give is a concert. Uh, you're looking for festivals in Boone, North Carolina. It says, here are all the festivals. And then it has links to each festival website where they got the information. Then there's a sidebar that can offer more related links. So in the music festival example, the sidebar has blogs and news sources about the festivals that are coming up. OpenAI says it's using direct content feeds from partners to build results. Partners include the owners of the Wall Street Journal, the Associated Press, Fox Media. Uh, and OpenAI says publishers will have a way to manage how they appear in search. So there will be an option to say, I would like my content to show up in search results. I do not want OpenAI to train its models on my content. Eventually, OpenAI would like to merge the search results into ChatGPT, in which case everyone who has access to ChatGPT would have access to it. Um, don't know when that's going to happen, how fast that's going to happen, but everyone's saying, obviously, they're gunning for Google. Will, uh, this is this is pretty compelling. Uh, is How big of a threat to Google do you think this is? Well, it's pretty compelling, but it's one of those classic, um, you if you play it forward, how does this end up playing out kind of scenarios? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, I think it's been fairly well documented that OpenAI lost, what, $5 billion last year? And yeah, that's, it was, that's the that's the going number. And you go, well, this is fantastic yesterday. because, um, you know, it's obviously a very clean interface. It looks good. It's integrated in ChatGPT. But there's still the obvious kind of question of, well, how is ChatGPT going to sort of, how is OpenAI going to manage to, to run all of this? Yeah. And you immediately go, well, there's kind of two options. You either put ads in it, in which case, how do you really know what it's telling you is is reliable? Or it's a it's a shakedown on publishers that want to be included, in which case it's it's pay to play. So it's a you know I suppose the other option is that it, the user pays a subscription fee, but it's it's going to be a, a tricky one to to navigate in terms of trust. I think for OpenAI. Yeah, we were sort of talking about some of the money making options that a company like OpenAI and any company that's doing something like this has. You, OpenAI could say, all right, we want people to use search GPT and we want people to like it. So maybe Sarah gets 30 searches a month or something like that, probably more if it's going to be a whole month. And then after that, you have to pay. Not unlike how many of you know the uh, AI tools are, are, are um, structured financially now. Putting ads into the mix uh, sounds messy, and I think that that's what OpenAI has going for it. I mean, obviously, only a very small amount of people are able to use it, and we've only seen uh, certain screenshots um, as far as, uh, you know, this news just breaking yesterday. And, you know, what it has going for it is it doesn't look like Google at all. It's clean. It's, uh, you know, d d tidy. And it's uh, not filled we were talking with sponsored links. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. In GDI yesterday, Justin made the point of like, it's just it looks so nice because it doesn't look like Google. And my, uh, I think the my main thing is we're so used to not just Google search, but let's just use Google as the example because it's the biggest Google, I'm so used to getting what I need from Google. I mean, sometimes I'm looking for something that just, I, I figure it doesn't exist on the internet because I try really hard. But for the most part, I know how to get what I'm looking for with Google. But I also create my queries to know what, what Google wants from me. To be able to reimagine the search experience is very intriguing it's going to change a lot of behavior for better or for worse. But I think it's fun to shake things up. But I don't, yeah, I, I, I think it, it, I'll be really interested to see what OpenAI does with this when it, the company obviously wants it to scale as, as much as possible and have people use it as much as possible. You got to get paid.
the days of having to know how to search are going to be gone because uh, just just like Netflix tried to be HBO before HBO became Netflix, uh, Google is trying to be ChatGPT before ChatGPT beca can become Google, right? So I think the idea, the advantage that OpenAI may have right now is that you can just ask a question naturally and it'll give you the answer. But Google is starting to do that with Gemini integration. I think that OpenAI can make this a paid service that doesn't need ads because they already have a paid service. So when they say we want to make this part of ChatGPT, to me that says you're already paying for ChatGPT. This will become part of that subscription and maybe more people will want it because they're not just paying for a search engine, they're paying for the entire chatbot as well. And that seems to be the kind of thing that they are able to get people to pay for. Solved. There we go. See? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was waiting for Sarah to say something uh, fantastically insightful. And I thought, I'm not going to step on that because I've got nothing insightful. I already insightful. did, Will. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been said. I mean, what nothing you insightful I'm to say beyond. Here? I'm all for um, I'm all for paying for things instead of ads these days. The last thing I need in my world right now is is just more advertising. So, as much as we've got, you know, there's a lot of talk about subscription fatigue. I think um, I've definitely more got ad fatigue than subscription fatigue. So I'm I'm all in favor of paying yeah. for something good. Well, and the the key thing OpenAI can say is you're you to a lot of people you're already paying for ChatGPT. So now you're just adding this, and a lot of people may be saying, you know what, I was gonna pay for Gemini. I was gonna pay for Claude or from Anthropic or something else. Maybe I'll choose ChatGPT after all. And actually, how long I before get... it gets bundled with like every cell phone plan you have or every home <laughs> internet plan you have? You know, at the moment, it's like, you know, you know I, buy a, yeah. I buy a cell phone on EE and I can get free Apple One. I got or Netflix, I buy it, you know, Spotify, I get my home internet, chat GPT with... search all in a Yeah, bundle. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's going to come as a freebie. That's I mean, for bad. those That's of us who are like search, paying for search, come on, because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in that camp. Like, well, I don't do it now. I mean, I do it in other ways, right? Uh, you know, ad supported stuff is, is going to get you somehow. But uh, there are <laughs> less elegant and I guess more elegant ways of serving ads. Uh, I hate the ad experience in, in, on certain platforms and less on others. Again, I think this is also just me being so used to the Google way of doing search that I'm like, eh, it's fine. You know what's an ad. Just don't look at it kind of thing. But again, reimagining, why not? Let's do this. People don't want to pay for search because they get it for free. But people might pay for something that includes search because it feels different. And I think that's, I think that's going to work to OpenAI's advantage here. Yeah. Well, uh, OpenAI is not the only company uh, working on a variety of AI things like chatbots. Uh, everybody kind of has a chatbot these days. In X's case, that chatbot is powered by Grok. That's X's, X's foray into LLMs, large language models. Today, a bunch of people noticed a new data sharing option enabled by default within your X settings that uses your data to train Grok. Now, Unsurprisingly, a lot of people don't like things like that because people like to opt in and not opt out. Grok data sharing can be disabled within the settings in your web app. I did it. It took five seconds. Not hard to do. Not in the mobile app, though. Got to use the web app. There's, of course, the conversation about whether your personal posts are yours and should not become trainable data without informed consent. Some people like to go a step further and say, you should be paid for that if that's what is being used to train a model because it's your uh, unique thoughts. A few things that make X a unique network today, though, uh, I think has been true since Twitter launched back in 2006. Uh, Twitter was always a place for news and personal stories. What I had for lunch, you know, was the joke for a while. Information in general, even before it started to get into multimedia and pictures and videos and live streams and, you know, audio and all that stuff. But it's also weird. Twitter is one of the weirdest places you can hang out. In fact, the term weird Twitter is, I mean, look it up. It's on Wikipedia. It, it's alive and well today. People still call it weird Twitter. I've never heard anyone say weird X. It's just called weird Twitter. You've got sports Twitter. You've got late night Twitter. You've got black Twitter. But weird Twitter is its own thing. It's nonsensical on purpose. That's the point. Memes, definitely up for grabs. Strange puzzles, uh, intentionally breaking a post thread that uh, confuses people. References that don't make sense. That's weird Twitter. Uh, if you remember Rick Rolling, that's where you 
get somebody, you trick them into clicking on the Rick Ashley song, uh, Never Gonna Give You Up. Rick Rowling was probably the best example of weird Twitter back in the day. And it's not even that weird. Uh, if you've been hanging out on, on the network for the better part of two decades, uh, that's, you know, it's, it's, but, but that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about, stuff like that. All this to say that uh, when we do allow Grok to use Twitter posts, because some people are just going to say, yeah, sure, use my stuff. And a lot of people are just never going to turn it off in their settings because they don't even know that the option exists. I want to know what that LLM is going to look like because I think it's going to be weird. It's going to look like Infowars, I think. <laughs> could. Well, I think that 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 could be part of the I, piece of the pie. I don't think yes. that's weird enough. I, I that's you know like uh, that that is a section uh, of X stuff. And, and granted, uh, Grok is not going to be trained solely on X posts. It's going to be trained on a lot of stuff, but it right. will be trained on X posts, and nothing else will. Uh, they they are not allowing other models to use this. I think that's the most interesting thing about this is that. Yes, it could make a very strange LLM, but that is a differentiating factor that a lot of these models are having a problem with. They have trained on almost everything that's available. The The new gold in training is data. Can you find data to train your model on? And the best data is human-created data. We had a, a study right. earlier this week uh, that showed if you train an AI model on other AI model-generated content, it just collapses into something that's useless. So human-created content, interestingly, is becoming the most valuable content on the internet, which is why X is doing this, I think. Can well, I just especially pick up on if some... you have access to human-created content that nobody else does. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's interesting to pick up on um, just a, a little element of this, which is this is something, you know, the, the Grok opt, opt in, opt out, you can do within the Twitter web platform and not the mobile app. And it's just another example of the Twitter mobile app just rapidly going downhill. It's progressively gotten worse over the last two years. You know, they killed off Tweetbot and all the good third party apps forcing you to use the official app. There's no way to get rid of ads in the official app, even with the super premium um, subscriptions. And you can't do half the stuff in it that you need to be able to do to run Twitter. You know, Twitter was the ultimate, you know, used to be the ultimate mobile platform, right? It started as text messaging. And it seems like it's moving more and more away from, from mobile as a platform of choice. Yeah, X is not the only one where it's frustrating when you're like, oh, I can't this do this in your app. Or... Sometimes it's even worse when the app kicks you out to its website in the app. Oh, uh, grim. It's super annoying. Does the X uh, app do that? I never no, use the No, no, I'm app. just saying other apps do that, and that's even oh, okay. more annoying. Um, yeah, that X, is X, I, first of all, we know X doesn't, uh, doesn't prioritize the Twitter service as, as its future. Uh, Elon Musk has, has said he wants to make this something that's more like a super app. Uh, but also it, it, it clearly like, I don't know. I Will, what are the chances within the next two years that X goes to just being a progressive web app where, where they're like, yeah, we don't even have a mobile app anymore. I mean, it sort of goes against everything that Elon's been saying, right? As you say, he's, you know, he said he wants to make Twitter a, a sort of super app. The whole concept of super apps came from mobile in China, right? So yeah. it feels like we're going to do a super app, but we're sort of going to prioritize desktop and we're going to slowly depreciate <laughs> mobile, deprecate mobile. And you're like, well, hang on. You know, it's just another example, I think, probably of Elon kind of making a grand statement and sort of not knowing what on earth he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps making contradictory statements, you know, and he means both of them. <laughs> hey, if you say two opposite things, can't be wrong. Yeah, uh, it's a sign of intelligence, they say. Uh, uh, folks, for anybody who, uh, real quick, for anybody who's sort of like, can they do this? Can they make people have to opt out? Um, well, it depends on who you are. The Irish Data Protection Commission, or DPC, uh, has expressed surprise over X's decision to use user posts to train Grok uh, and the way that they decided to roll it out. So we'll probably hear more about that sooner than later. Do you know what I have not expressed after hearing that story, Sarah? Uh, no, I don't, because you surprise. haven't told me. I am not surprised oh. that, that, <laughs> that the Europe is expressing surprise. Boo! Are you surprised yeah. now? Okay. I am. 
what I'm also not surprised about is Tom's Top 5 has a new episode. Uh, Roger and I collaborated for tips when buying used technology. You want to save some money? Buy some used tech. Buy some refurbished tech. Save a few bucks. We got some tips to help you out. You can catch that at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram, and at YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. As CrowdStrike can tell you, running things on the internet is very challenging. Uh, it's uh, it's harder than it looks. Uh, and uh, Will Harris, uh, thankfully, isn't trying to run a CrowdStrike, but he is running an e-commerce website. Uh, you got to keep things up to date with information and systems. You need to make sure you quickly fix bugs. You have an audience that notices the bugs uh, and possibly is a little unforgiving. Will, you have recent experience with this after a system change to the Unbound website. Thank you for being willing to talk about this. Uh, start with with where it started. Uh, very happy to be here, Tom, and thank you for um, for having me on. Always always a pleasure to be mentioned in the same sentence as CrowdStrike, Frankie. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make you feel better by comparison. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thankfully, we didn't bring down um, half the world with us. No, so we had we've had a really interesting kind of um, what month are we in now? July, Craig. We had a really interesting six months, seven months um, since moving wholesale to a, to a brand new e-commerce platform, and that was something that um, we got caught up with you with launching your your new book on Unbound, uh, Synced, which we are very pleased to be publishing, and it has been you know a real lesson for me. Um, or I'm not going to say a lesson, a really new experience. I've done plenty of website migrations in the past. Um, plenty of new platform deploys, um, and something always goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think the only certainty in doing any of these kind of um, system switchovers is that something is going to go wrong and it's never the thing that you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, um, you know, one of the lessons for me has always been, um, yeah, expect the unexpected and and be ready to to get after it so i think yeah when we we switched the website over um the end of november beginning of december uh we moved from a a fully in-house completely custom uh ruby app that had been uh sort of progressively kept online over sort of seven or eight years um and was frankly um one step away from falling over at, at any point uh -huh. in, in its history or if our you know cto went under a bus nobody on earth would have any idea how to fix it we switched that out for a, a customized shopify setup and it felt a little bit like pick your poison which is um you know we've got a system that kind of works but at any point could fall over and a system that you know is going to have something go wrong but at least you know that there'll be a group of people that are around to fix it and it's one of those things where you have to make a, you know, you have to make a sort of tactical decision on on which risk you're you're sort of willing to take the, the f take the furthest. And that was kind of how we ended up, um, yeah, with a with a with a fun few weeks of um, of bug squashing. Yeah, why why do bugs happen? Like, what are the what are the reasons that this happens? Because uh, you're right, they always happen. But I'm sure there's people who are like, okay, but why? Why can't you just you know nail it down? Yeah, so I was actually talking to somebody um, about this in a different context a couple of weeks ago. I was I was looking at um, one of my friends is um, doing retro PC builds, and he's got this fantastic workshop full of you know every motherboard and processor and and you know uh, graphics card from sort of nineteen ninety seven to two thousand and five, you know, under the sun. Nice. And he builds these PCs, and you know every one of them is a little bit different, and you never know. You know something something's going to be wrong with each of them. Like one memory stick is got the wrong solder joint or you know and i was thinking back to when i was building pcs in you know 1999 i built my first pc and you bought some memory and you bought a motherboard and you bought a cpu and you bought a graphics card and you put it all together and it didn't work you had no idea what was wrong because you didn't have every other configuration to try all the parts that you have mm -hmm. and i often think about this with with web development which is you cannot possibly test you know you can do testing you can do unit testing you can do all the things that software developers you know should be doing but you cannot test every combination of software update, mobile phone, desktop browser, operating system, cookie preferences. Uh -huh. uh, you cannot test every combination of that. And, you know, something is going to not work somewhere. And, you know, the question is always, is it a bug? Is it something that is unique to that user? Is it widespread? Is it reproducible? Um, a lot of the time it's... Um, it's not a bug, it's the way it's meant to work, but because it works differently 
people think it's something wrong. Um, so I think the, you know, overall, it's it's so, it, you know, it's impossible to test every configuration that's out there. And, you know, no testing environment is going to stand up to, um, you know, to real life deployment. You know, we see a lot of the time people release deploys, you know, everywhere that have to be rolled back. And I think, you know, it, there's a question of just how you know once you've once you've committed to a deploy, do you do you stay with it and try and fix it, or do you roll it back? It's um, you just you just can't test everything. So at a certain point, you've got to put it into the world and just trust that you can triage it as you go. Do you uh, so, so talk a little bit about what you did with Unbound and 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 what the journey was to to figuring that out? Because because commerce is more complex. Yeah, so commerce is complex, not least because, um, you know, you're not just running a website that's, you know, that's, that's you know, giving information or something. You're like, you're, you've literally got customer data. You have all sorts of legal obligations around that data. You're holding, you know, in some cases, credit card numbers. So you've got to get this stuff right. And the one thing, you know, I did um, when I was at, um, I, was, I was running Condé Nast Digital for a number of years, as you will remember. And um, we did a complete switchover of, of Vogue.com. And, you know, it was one of those things where you you can see that something is going to, you know, go slightly wrong, but you can try and anticipate a few of them. And then when it comes up, you know, the thing that we always used to say was building a new website isn't hard. Um, moving data from one website, from an old system to a new system is what's hard. And that's doubly true in e-commerce because you're not just moving user profiles, you're moving real user data with, you know, mm. addresses, phone numbers, um, credit cards. And I think for us... You know, building a new building a new platform in Shopify is you know is not it's not hard. It's not easy, but it's not you know you're not trying to sort of reinvent the wheel in many cases. But when you're trying to extract data from a proprietary system, reformat it in a way that doesn't unmask any data that you shouldn't be unmasking, try to move it into a new platform which you know has got its own data structures that you're trying to adapt into. And in some cases, you're trying to modify the existing data structures to try and make them work. There's an awful lot of areas where things can go wrong, not in the building of the new thing, but in the migrating from the from the old to the new. And it's, you know, my old CTO at Condé used to say, it's, it's the, the hard thing is not building a new system. The hard thing is always the migration. Yeah. yeah. And we had, we, you know, we probably spent three months building something new and six months managing the migration. And no matter how many times you try and migrate, um, in theory, when you actually turn it on live, um, something is probably going to go wrong. Yeah. And we found you know, a number of things that were related to, um, we had people who couldn't log in to their accounts because um, they maybe had dual, they, so couldn't log in for a number of reasons. One of the reasons would be they had two accounts and they didn't know which one they'd migrated. And so uh -huh. they were trying to log into the wrong one, whereas we had sort of deduped them for the sake of you know data efficiency. There were cases where um, the Shopify system, by default, didn't you know was trying to be um, kind of overly friendly with cookies, whereas actually it kind mm. of needed to be a bit more aggressive about cooking people in order to keep them logged in. Otherwise, they were sort of getting logged out every time they moved away. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. have predicted that because in all the browsers that we tested, you know, it it was wasn't doing that. There were um, instances where. Um, for the first 24 or 48 hours while the DNS updated, people were requesting password reset emails because uh -huh. um, they were sort of getting a prompt to log in, couldn't log in. Uh -huh. um, but the emails the password reset weren't getting through because Gmail was marking them all as spam because they weren't yeah. coming from the correct DNS. And we're like, okay, <laughs> well, we you literally can't the control DNS. that. The, the DNS yeah. takes as long as it, as it takes it to takes. do. Yeah. Um, and so you can try and accommodate all those things up front, but it's... You know, it's it's incredibly hard to um, to try and take you know account of all of that, and then of course you get what becomes a self fulfilling prophecy is that you're um, you know inevitably you start getting complaints on Twitter, complaints on Reddit, complaints to the email inbox, and you start running around trying to work out what everyone's complaining about, going down multiple dead ends or multiple um, false positives, let's say, mm -hmm. um, to try and find out what's actually happening. And then people get frustrated because you're not getting back to them quick enough, but you're trying to chase down the problem. So there is a, um, you know, we, had, we, we put a really big banner at the top saying, you know, the top of our website saying, look, bear with us. We're, we're doing a big changeover here. Yeah, um, basically a big we know. 
<laughs> yeah, we know. We know. We're trying. We're working on it. <laughs> but, you know, if you've, you know, the difference between a, a website and, and an e-commerce platform is, you know, this is people's money that we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. You want and to in many cases, telling them, you know, look, guys, we're, we're working on it is not is not quite fast enough for them. Yeah. No, no kidding. Well, it sounds like uh, you you've finally found your way out into the light again. So congratulations on on persevering well, through all. Well, thank that. you. I mean, I would say we're um, you know we're still a way away, and we're still coming upon things that we that we didn't anticipate. And you know, a classic thing that we that we didn't anticipate at all was we you know as you know, um, Unbound works on a kind of crowd. You know, we crowdfund books, and we yeah. you know that's why we call it reader powered publishing, and we're we're delighted to have your book there, you know, crowdfunding away. But we had all the payment system set up. We'd moved everything. We migrated everything perfectly. We set everything live on Shopify. And within 48 hours, Shopify had contacted us to say, oh, yeah, by the way, if you read the terms and conditions, we don't allow people to use Shopify pay for crowdfunding. <laughs> oh, no. And we were like, wow, that would have been, re- you know, that would have been really know. helpful for our Shopify account exec to tell us, you know, at some point in the three months before launch. But, you know, they didn't even catch that within their own T's and C's. Yeah, it was only yeah. when, you know, somebody internally raised it. So, you know, there's occasions where, you know, you can do everything you think right. You can work with your account exec all the way through the process and still something happens. The one thing that also always comes back to me is um, we used to have a um, an acronym which we used to deploy when I was doing my, my computing degree. We used to talk about um, an acronym called PEBCAC. Oh, yeah. Which was a uh, problem exists between customer and keyboard, <laughs> which was sort of a really good u- acronym for user error. And unfortunately, there comes a point where um, when you're deploying something you've worked on for nine months, you, you see everything as very obvious. Um, and to a new customer, it, it, it might be completely obscure. So um, very hard to get into the minds of, of people from all over the world as, as we have to. We uh, we have uh, similar uh, similar. Uh, Acronym uh, problem exists between keyboard and share, but it's the ig- exact same sentiment. Yeah. Other way around. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Will Harris, for being with us today. Obviously, uh, people should go to Unbound and check out uh, all the books on offer. Tom's new book being one of them, tomsnewbook.com. Uh, if you haven't uh, ordered it, you should. But where can people find you online, Will? Where do you hang out? They can find me um, on x as the kids say um at will harris with one l and two r's or same thing on instagram will harris one l and two r's and if people do want to go to tomnewbook.com and go and check out synced on unbound.com if they use i thought it'd be a very fitting thing to make a promo code bug bug <laughs> if you want to come in and type in bug you can get 10 percent off any of the um any of the pledge packages and come and support come support tom's new book Nice, nice. That'll be great. Uh, I just handed in the first draft, so you know, you, you, it's, it's real, folks. You, I've, you're I've safe. been told it's Go absolutely it. terrible, but we've got plenty of time to improve it, Tom. It's fine. Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, yeah. Uh, we just need to cut it in half, and then it'll be fine. Just take out half the words, and it'll be good. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. It's Friday. We've got a fun-filled tech quiz about books and technology and eBooks and publishing. Uh, can you answer the questions before we do? Play along and find out. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. And of course, find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We always have a good live audience. Join us if you can. We're back on Monday with Nika Monford joining us. Have a great weekend, everyone. Talk to you soon. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer, Joe Kuntz. Producer at large, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Skylas One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gav- 
Gadget Virtuoso and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast adds support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows included Scott Johnson and Justin Robert Young. And our guests this week were Trisha Hirschberger, Kate Lawrence, and Will Harris. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>